Hi everyone, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, and welcome to this International Centre for Translational Digital Health Seminar. I'm delighted to welcome three uh, collaborators from the University of Toronto. We have Alicia Kilfoy, Lindsay Jim, and Charlene Chu, um, and they're going to talk to you about various remote monitoring and virtual care topics. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over to Alicia, who's going to get us started. Yeah, yeah. Great, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, so my name is Alicia Kilfoy. I am a first year PhD student at the University of Toronto in the Faculty of Nursing. And I'm going to be speaking today about a systematic review that's really a joint project with several co-authors, including Dr. Lindsay Jibb and Dr. Charlene Chu, who you will be hearing uh, from shortly. And the name of the review is Nurse-Led Remote Digital Support for Adults with Chronic Conditions. There we go. <laughs> so I'm sure as we're all aware, the prevalence of chronic health conditions is increasing across the globe for several reasons, including the fact that globally the population, the population is aging and also due to health advancements and medical advancements, um, mortality rates have largely decreased across the globe. The pre having a chronic condition um, can have a significant impact to patients, their family members, particularly their primary caregivers, who often experience uh, caregiver strain, health systems in terms of managing the treatment of these conditions, and ultimately the economy. Therefore, interventions are needed to support self-management, prevent deterioration and hospitalization, and ultimately improve patient quality of life. Remote digital health support interventions have the potential to address this uh, problem. Remote digital health support um, are interventions that involve a digital device, such as a mobile health app or website, which links the patient with a chronic condition in their own home to a clinical setting. In the literature, these interventions have been shown to increase the patient's ability to self-manage, increase satisfaction and quality of life, decrease mortality rates, and ultimately reduce hospital admissions. Nurses are well primed uh, to increase the efficacy and impact of digital health in this population due to their expertise uh, in supporting adults with chronic conditions. Studies in the literature have shown that combining digital health and nursing care can create healthier communities broadly and may improve patient health outcomes. From our own qualitative reports, patients and caregivers have indicated that nurse engagement in care is a sought after clinical feature. Despite this, no review to date has synthesized and looked at the uh, effectiveness of nurse-led digital support on health outcomes in this population. Therefore, our goal was to achieve this and to synthesize the literature examining the effectiveness of nurse-led digital support on health outcomes in adults with chronic conditions. To achieve this goal, we first uh, created a search strategy focused on nurses as clinical professionals and telemedicine. And then we searched Cochrane Central, MBOSS, Medline, PsychInfo uh, in December, 2022. We decided to only include primary literature, uh, randomized controlled trials, so no pilots, only full trials, and those that were published in English. To be included, uh, the RCT had to include a control group of usual care, meaning that the digital nurse-led intervention was compared to that usual care group. Um, just touching on that again, to be included in uh, the review, the intervention had to be nurse-led or nurse-managed or something along those lines. In addition, uh, there had to be a digital component where data was transferred from the patient uh, to the nurse. So we decided to exclude studies that involved only phone calls. So we did have quite a lot of studies to screen. Uh, we managed to get it down from 6,843 in title and abstract all the way down to 44 papers, which belong to 40 unique studies. And just briefly looking at uh, the risk of bias quality appraisal tool, you can see that they all kind of sit uh, around this medium risk of bias indicated by the yellow in the bar graphs. So now this is just uh, the basic information pertaining to the studies that we identified. So again, we identified 40. 
They were published uh, between 2003 and 2022. So in the search strategy, we decided to not limit the uh, time period that the papers could be published in because we really wanted to see the full evolution of these interventions over time. The different papers were published in a wide range of countries, including uh, predominantly the United States, where 11 studies came from, uh, China, which published six, and then Taiwan and Turkey, which published three. And then there's a handful of countries that follow, which published two and one, respectively. The type of chronic condition that uh, was the focus of the study also varied greatly. Uh, 11 were focused on diabetes, and that encompassed type one and type two. Eight were focused on cardiovascular disease, Six were focused on a combination of uh, conditions, and this most commonly I found included diabetes uh, and cardiovascular disorders. Three were focused on cancer, three focused on mental health, two on obesity, two on asthma, two on muscular skeletal, one on chronic kidney disorder, one on neurological, and lastly, one focused on COPD. The sample size of these studies also ranged greatly, with the range being 45 to 1,665, and that study uh, was a multi-year study that was uh, really large. So the mean of the studies was approximately 205, with a standard deviation of 266. We then went on to classify the different types of interventions identified using three different um, classification systems. So the first was the type of digital modality used to uh, implement the intervention. So 10 used a website, 10 used a mobile app, nine used a sort of novel monitoring system where the system was given specifically to the patient so that they could transfer uh, clinical data from the patient to the nurse, either through a landline or Bluetooth. Four were texting, three were multi-component, meaning that they incorporated more than one of these modalities. Two used emails and two used uh, video-based platforms. The second classification system uh, was digital clinical support service. So how exactly was the nurse supporting uh, patients? So the first category that we uh, created was that data was sent to the nurse. So most often clinical data and the nurse reviewed the data and then responded if needed. So 11 of those studies uh, were specifically that type of support. Seven of the studies were simply uh, virtual appointments with the nurse, either uh, through texting or uh, video phone calls, things along those lines. Five were virtually enabled nurse health education, where nurses created and sent education to patients. And then lastly, 17 of the studies combined uh, these different types of support services. And then the last in the classification was how often or how frequently the nurse was involved in the, in the intervention. And this ranged, as you can see, uh, from daily, which were eight studies, all the way to only as needed. And that was approximately 11 studies. So when you look, when we looked at the timeline of the interventions, you can see um, how they have changed over the past two decades. So in the early 2000s, it started off uh, with these no uh, monitoring systems that were novel at the time and allowed that transfer of data, most predominantly through a landline. Uh, basic video phone platforms and websites uh, were most common. And this kind of progressed throughout the years um, to a multi-component website in the early 2010s. WhatsApp became popular and online messenger as well. And then what we saw uh, most recently was the growth of mobile application and then multi-component interventions, which involved apps, texting, and email, things like that became more, uh, more common. And then throughout the years, uh, how the nurse was also providing uh, support also seemed to change as well. In the early 2000s, again, it seemed like the nurse was most commonly providing support through only one manner, whether that was that they received uh, data and then responded appropriately or provided education. But as time has gone on, it seems like the nurses are providing more robust level of support. To kind of emphasize this, 14 of the 17 studies that were published after 2019 provided uh, a combination of remote digital support to patients. 
So as you can imagine, due to the heterogeneity of the different chronic conditions that we included in the studies, we did have a wide range of outcomes, outcomes of interest that we identified, and we chose to include outcomes in the review if they had been assessed by more than two uh, studies. And the way that we've conceptualized our outcome, you can see uh, in this uh, diagram on the left. So we've classified outcomes into four different subheadings. The first is patient self-management, including self-care and self-efficacy, which can have an impact on the patient's clinical status, including their blood pressure, their hemoglobin A1C, and their quality of life. These clinical outcomes can also have an impact on their resource use, so how often they're going um, to the emergency rooms, they're being admitted to the hospital, things along those lines. And ultimately, all of that can have an impact on their life and the satisfaction of the care that they receive. So each of these um, four categories, I'll, I'll present on four separate slides. The first is patient self-management. And you can see on the, on the left uh, column, this three different outcomes we identified. So self-efficacy, self-care and treatment adherence. And how we've pooled this data is that uh, we counted every time self-efficacy was measured in each paper and pooled them together. So for example, if a study measured self-efficacy twice using two different measurement tools, we would count that as two different, um, two different results. In terms of the columns, a significantly positive patient impact is defined as a p-value of less than 0.05, and a positive patient impact means that the digital health interventions significantly improve the patient's health compared to usual care. And then in the last column, the significant negative patient impact is just the vice versa, that it would have a negative impact on the patient's care compared to usual care. So you can see here that uh, self-efficacy, self-care, and treatment adherence uh, had a there was a significantly positive patient impact in 36 uh, to 45 percent of the times that it was measured in um, these studies. Importantly to note that in no uh, studies was there a significantly negative impact on the patient's um, health. To note, uh, treatment adherence improved uh, the most with interventions that involved a scheduled meeting with the nurse opposed to interventions that uh, only provided nurse care as needed or on a monthly basis. In addition, uh, self-efficacy uh, was most improved in interventions that were delivered using a website. Now, uh, moving into clinical variables, and I know this is an overwhelming um, data table, so I'll just highlight some key points. Um, so first, uh, you can see that depression improved, had a significant, there was a significantly positive improvement in depression in 70% of the times that it was measured um, in the studies. And then uh, quality of life and hemoglobin A1C significantly improved 55% of the time that it was measured. Importantly, both hemoglobin A1C and quality of life improved predominantly in interventions, which involved a combination of nurse support and a combination of digital techniques as well. And then moving on to resource usage, um, you can see that Emergency room visits improved 29% of the time that they were measured in these interventions compared to usual care, while hospital admissions and readmissions improved 22% of the time. Again, important to note, a continual trend is that none of these interventions have a significantly negative impact on the care that the patients receive. And then for the last group, uh, satisfaction with care or ultimately life impact, um, four to six times that this outcome was measured, or 67%, um, digital, the digital health intervention uh, significantly improved the outcome compared to usual care. Importantly, this measure um, seemed to have the most impact in interventions where you could access the nurse as needed, opposed to on a scheduled basis. So overall, uh, these interventions can have a positive impact on the patient's self-management ability, their clinical status, their resource use, and ultimately their life impact. However, we did identify several gaps uh, in the literature, which include the following. First, were interventions actually co-designed with nurses and patients? That seemed to be something that wasn't fully addressed in studies. 
how much training did the nurse receive or experience did the nurse have prior to implementing the interventions? Do the interventions have an economical impact? Because that's always important to fully assess. Did the participants value the nurse's involvement in the intervention themselves? And lastly, how did the patients make use of the interventions? Did they actually adhere to the intervention recommendations and engage with the interventions as expected? This adherence uh, and fidelity assessment didn't really seem to be something that was often done by trials. So future studies need to answer these questions and also compare the effectiveness of nurse-led digital support compared to digital support without nurses' involvement to fully solidify the importance of the nurse's uh, role. So ultimately, nurse-led remote digital support interventions have the potential to improve health outcomes in adults with chronic conditions compared to usual care. However, future studies must focus on addressing several gaps to identify how best to design these interventions in the future. So thank you very much. And these are my references. Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks, Charlene. Um, Alicia, sorry. sorry. Um, does anybody does anybody online have any questions for Alicia before we move on to the next? We've got sort of three short talks. Um, as part of this. Does anybody have any questions before we move on? Um, I wanted to ask a question actually, and um, thank you, I really enjoyed that. And I thought two things that sprung to mind. One was that nurse-led services seem more prominent in the US potentially than in other parts of the world. That came out as they were the highest number of studies from the US. Um, I don't know if that's to do with the way the healthcare system is delivered, particularly in the US. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you have any comments on that. <laughs> Yeah, I think that would be interesting to dig into and see if those interventions are privately funded or publicly. Mm -hmm. I think that would be interesting to something yeah. to dig into. Um, and the other, the, I think the two points you made at the end, uh, or two of the points you made at the end, are these nurse-led um, digital health interventions co-designed with nurses, really important mm -hmm. because the people that are delivering them should be involved in their design, mm -hmm. um, particularly if um, the services are nurse-led anyway, the healthcare services, um, and secondly, um, the training that's provided to nurses delivering these interventions. I think I mentioned earlier in a conversation my, my experience of working with research nurses in particular, they've often said they hate computers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're asking a group, a community of people who are used to delivering care and interacting with people, but not necessarily technology as part of their role, it's really important to make sure you've got the right amount of training and appropriate training. Um, so just a couple of yeah. additional comments. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't think it's fair to the nurse or the patient if the nurse isn't Absolutely. fully yeah. trained because yeah. they can't provide the care that uh, the patient should receive. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. We have a couple of questions online. Should we, should I read them or? Yeah, yeah, sure. Ask them? Hey, Rebecca uh, asked, are you able to speak to whether these nurse-led uh, interventions were mainly for adults? Are there any pediatric ones or if so, any kind of standout difference? Yeah, so for this uh, review, we decided to only include adults with chronic conditions, um, just because the outcomes included in the pediatric uh, studies uh, were quite different from the ones that were included in the adult trials, uh, but hoping to write up something about the pediatric uh, interventions in the future. Thank you. And there is one more from Danielle. Does the mode of delivery have any impact on these findings? Uh, for example, WhatsApp versus website? Yeah, so that's something that we're still digging into uh, right now to fully solidify. Um, so hoping to have that answered uh, shortly in the future. When the paper comes out. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and hopefully we can circulate the paper around the International Centre. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that would be amazing. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, Lindsay, are we ready yeah. to move on? Yeah. Can I just get a question on what kind of Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's super interesting. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was wondering if you know anything about the nurse perspectives on sort of blended delivery. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I don't, but I think that's something that's really important in the in the story because, like Charlie said, like some nurses okay. hate um, yeah. computers and technology. So I think that kind of plays back into the aspect of important training mm -hmm. and making sure that they adequately receive education yeah. prior to expecting them to implement yeah. the interventions. It's so interesting as well as on the 
the cost effectiveness because that would be really interesting to look at as well. Because yeah. What do we really know about it? And we always argue that digital solutions will reduce costs and they're sort of scalable and everything. And now we're introducing more blended approaches, which are obviously more expensive up front. Yeah. But whether or not they'll actually introduce costs. Yeah. Share the screen again. Uh, there is. With us online, the mouse is not behaving itself. <laughs> it's really not. It's funny that I'm going to do a talk about it. It's too bad. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's the book. Can you see Lindsay's slides online? Oh, I'm so sorry. Can you go back? Yeah. Thank you. Some somebody say yes. In in the chat. Either in the chat or well, I can see them on my oh, phone. Sorry. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so, oh, we have a thumbs up. Thank you, Danielle. Um, first, just wanted to actually say hi to Danielle and, and Rebecca. I know each of them from the pain world, so it's lovely to see you here. Um, and, and thank you, everybody, for coming. What I'm going to talk about uh, really kind of builds upon uh, the work that Alicia just described regarding uh, these kind of nurse-engaged um, remote monitoring and virtual care solutions for chronic conditions. I'm going to talk to you specifically about some work that we've been doing developing out the pain care app, which uh, stands for pain caregiver resource, and this is an app really aimed at supporting parents and self managing their younger child's cancer pain. So uh, just to give a little bit of context related to pediatric cancer pain, what we do know is that most young children uh, with cancer will experience pain over the time course of, of their treatment. This pain may be related to the disease itself, things like tumor-related pain, the many invasive medical procedures and treatments these children undergo, um, or may show up as chronic pain as well. So things like peripheral neuropathies related to, for instance, surgery or certain chemotherapies that children receive. Also know from, from the literature that this pain occurs both in an inpatient setting, uh, so when children are in the hospital, that's been the most studied, um, and also in the outpatient uh, setting as well. Less research done, but some studies by our group and others are starting to show that outpatient pain is a particular problem for young children with cancer, particularly because when outside of the hospital, they have uh, less access to that clinician-based uh, pain management that they would get in the hospital, so things like access to, to, to opioid medications. We also know that this pain has a negative impact on child functioning, dampens quality of life, and importantly for this study, really does result in family caregiver distress. And so on, on the uh, side of your screen, really wanted to make the case that it's not just us that thinks pediatric cancer pain is a problem that ought to be researched. So a couple of years ago now, uh, we did a pan-Canadian research prioritization exercise to really ask the community, so ask children with cancer, their family members and clinicians, what do you think researchers ought to tackle next? And what we started to hear back from the community was actually that cancer pain is something that they, that they should, uh, researchers should address. So one question here says, if I can read it, how, how can treatment related side effects and long term effects, including pain, uh, be prevented, managed and screened for in pediatric oncology patients and survivors? Second question reading how to help a child deal with neurologic pain post treatment, what interventions work? Uh, so that, with that being said, what we also know is that pain is a particular problem for younger children with cancer. So thinking about those children that are kind of 2 to 11 years of age, they may be particularly vulnerable to undermanaged pain, uh, first because they have a limited capacity for, for pain self-report. So when compared to adolescents or adults, have a harder time saying, this is how severe my pain is, this is where it's located, this is what works. Um, and then also really do rely on those caregivers, whether it be their parents or, or their clinicians, to manage their pain. So less able than an adult, for instance, to seek out a pain medication uh, and take it. Um, there's also evidence indicating that family caregivers, so the parents of these children, really do desire access to digital means to support them in doing the work of caring for their younger child with cancer at home. 
And then um, finally, what we aim to do then is redesign, reapply a co-design approach that we had already used to build out um, a mobile solution for pain management in adolescents with cancer uh, and modify that, that app, really making it appropriate for use by family caregivers of those younger children with cancer. And so there actually is really good evidence out there. And I think some people on the call will, will know this related to how we might manage pain in children with cancer. So on the right side of your screen, a screenshot showing um, a, a paper that was published describing the methodology for the development of a suite of clinical practice guidelines looking at reducing pain in children with cancer. Uh, on the left side of your screen, the first such uh, clinical practice guideline that, that was published, I had the pleasure of being involved, and here we focused on how we might reduce pain and distress related to needle procedures in children with cancer. So we actually have good evidence related to how we might manage uh, cancer pain. We just probably might need to think about how we can get that evidence into the hands of people who need to use it. And then so thinking about that, thinking about how caregivers uh, really do desire this, this kind of digital means to do this type of work, what we aimed to do then is really partner with uh, the people who would be involved in, in, in the usage of this app, so clinicians and family caregivers, to co-design out um, uh, an intervention to manage pain in their young children. And this is, is, is the framework that we kind of followed. Um, Pre-designed phase, really looking at contextual inquiry and then preparation and training for involvement in the co-design process. Then the co-design process itself. So building out uh, what uh, this intervention might look like and then post-design. Gonna talk to you today a little bit about uh, the pre-design phase and some of our co-design um, work as well. So this is really just that, that previous um, slide operationalized um, for the purposes of us building out the pain care app. So what we're really gonna talk about is the pre-design work that we did, establishing the context of, of pediatric cancer pain and thinking about what digital pain intervention ingredients might look like. Co-design work where we, we co-designed out a prototype uh, wireframes with this group and did some work iteratively um, testing the usability and refining that prototype. And then in the springtime, we're aiming to start our trial feasibility examination where we're going to do a pilot uh, RCT of pain care and then finally moving into our effectiveness and implementation um, work. I want to kind of note that on the bottom of, of your screen, um, all of this work has been done in close partnership with OPAC, so Ontario. Uh, parents advocating for children with cancer, Ontario being a province in Canada, and, they, and really OPAC has been integral to all of the work that we've done. So involved since project con conception, helping us think of ideas, helping us recruit parents to be involved in the study, helping us disseminate our results, helping us um, secure funding for the work, and truly really we couldn't have done any of this without, without OPAC. So how did we do um, our kind of uh, contextual uh, work, our pre-designed methods? We asked the study question, what is the parental experience of caring for young children with cancer pain and how might M Health Solutions support those parents? Used a qualitative descriptive study design involving semi-structured interviews. And for those interviews, we uh, spoke with parents of two to 11 year olds with cancer who spent at least a portion of their time outside of the hospital and who had had pain in the previous week and the clinicians caring for such children. Recruited them from two centers, the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto um, and the Children's Hospital of Orange County in Orange, California. So this is, is who was involved in the study. At the end of the day, when we reached data saturation, we had recruited 21 uh, parent caregivers and 21 clinicians. Caregivers, most often mothers, but we were happy to be able to recruit um, some fathers and one stepmother. The associated child was usually two to seven years of age. Caregivers, uh, usually 30 to 39 years. And then um, we were happy to be able to recruit caregivers with a variety of self-identified races and ethnicities. In terms of clinicians, we recruited mainly nurses, but again, did manage to recruit an interdisciplinary group there. They were most often 30 to 39 years and um, had worked clinically for an average uh, 10 years. 
So this, this slide here just shows um, in kind of graphical form our thematic analysis of our first question, which was really what is the experience of caring for a young child with cancer pain at home? You can see that we kind of pulled out of the data three interconnected themes. The first really described the child's multidimensional pain experience. So uh, caregivers and clinicians telling us that children did have severe pain at home happened frequently and, and actually lasted for a long time in many cases. This pain affected the child's affect, causing anxiety, and also affected the things that children did. So um, their, inter, their um, ability to play, their ability to mobilize, uh, their ability to eat, their ability to socialize. So things that we actually know are important for recovery from the actual disease impacted because of pain. Uh, pain also had a, a impact on the family unit emotional effects for, for the family caregivers causing uh, sadness, anxiety, distress, care coordination effects. So caregivers telling us, I spend a lot of my time calling the hospital, speaking with the fellow on call if it's after hours, taking my child to the emergency room, um, and then practical effects on the family too. So changing the things that the family would normally do. When we asked about what pain assessment and management looked like at home, um, heard that parents actually were doing a lot of great work with regard to, to pain management. So they had these kind of core strategies that they were usually um, able to, to implement um, at home um, and they were comfortable seeking support from their clinicians. Their assessment, pain assessment uh, practices at home really uh, involved them using experiential knowledge of what the child's pain um, looked like. So knowing their child and knowing that they were in pain as opposed to kind of prospective uh, pain assessments. But they did make recommendations as to things they wanted um, in, in uh, tools in their toolbox kind of thing. So they wanted um, more uh, education and resources related to how they might manage their child's pain, more connectivity with the hospital um, and uh, family to family connections as well. So that kind of peer support. We then uh, started to look at, at um, what ingredients our intervention needed to have to give it the best chance of being effective. And we used a combination of two theoretical models to uh, build out um, our intervention. So these, these questions related to each of these constructs formed the basis of our semi-structured interview with parents. We used the unified theory of technology um, acceptance and utilization to um, structure what, what aspects the app might need in order to give it the best chance of being accepted and used. And then layered upon that, um, another um, theory which really describes what caregivers need to, to um, engage in outside the hospital in order to care for a patient with chronic uh, condition. We also um, uh, kept this semi-structured interview quite open-ended in nature, so asked about other aspects that parents might feel this app ought to have because we didn't want to kind of pigeonhole ourselves to only constructs that related uh, to each of these two theories. And so this is, is what we found at the end of the day. We've had four themes related um, to the app. Theme one really spoke to this kind of performance ex expectancy piece. And caregivers really did think that this app would help them in doing the work of caring for their child with cancer pain. Theme four focused on some challenges related to implementing this app clinically that we'll need to think about down the road. But themes two and three focused on, on active ingredients for the app itself. And so theme two really speaks to recommendations that probably uh, should be integrated into the development of of any really good digital health um, in, in intervention, uh, things like usability, making it accessible to across languages, um, having kind of gamification mentioned by parents is something that might support them in getting involved in, in the intervention, and then credibility too. So this really spoke about spoke to integrating clinicians into the intervention, uh, basing the intervention on quality evidence base and other items there. Theme three really spoke to recommendations that would take this kind of generalized digital health intervention and make it specific to cancer pain. So things like um, building in the capacity to take a detailed pain history, routine pain assessments, uh, providing parents with, with multidimensional integrative pain advice, and then capacity to track pain over time. And our kind of participants let us know that if we kind of delivered on each of these buckets, um, would end up building out a high value uh, caregiver led app. 
And so that that's what we did. We went into the co-design uh, work with caregivers and built out these kind of wireframes for what the app might look like. And we've done some usability testing of these, these sort of lo-fi uh, wireframes to date. If, if you're at all interested in looking at, at how we built out those, those wireframes with the group um, and what their, their, their component pieces are, you can find that information in this paper here. Um, so then really in conclusion, uh, hope I made the case that childhood cancer pain is an area requiring research attention. Um, app solutions appear to be a viable um, way to start to get at this problem. And then our next steps are really the high fidelity usability testing of the app, which is ongoing now. We're working uh, with partners in Quebec, which is Canada's uh, predominantly French speaking province to adapt this app to uh, the cultural context of Franco-Canadians. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, aiming to launch our pilot RCT in the spring. So I really wanted to just conclude with a quote from a mother of a six-year-old that says, I can't always do it at home. You know, she's in pain or she's really sick or she's not in a good mood because of what's happening. And I just want something to help me get through this, you know? So I think really kind of underscores the need to, to build out these interventions. And then thank you. Thank you to our family and caregiver and clinician participants and our wonderful team. Amazing. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, any questions from any questions from anybody online? Yeah, we do have one oh. question from Rebecca. Okay. Uh, is your pathway to intervention developed uh, development rooted in any specific behavior change intervention design theory, or is it more of a cluster of theories? We've kind of so far kept it open, and, and it's rooted really in a cluster of of um, behavior change theories. We've relied on on some of the kind of the staples of behavior change theory, including like nudges and, and these types of things to remind people to engage with the intervention um, and tried to base it on that on our um, on the, the UTAUT um, framework to make sure that that what we build into it is important to end users and hopefully that will kind of make using it become a habit and then change behavior over time. Thank you. Um, any other questions online? I'm mindful that with time, it's probably oh, gosh. good for us to move on yeah. to Charlene so that you're not waking up your Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Well, while that's happening, I'm just going to throw out a horrible oh. question, possibly. Um, you you did some interviews with um, caregivers and with clinicians, but not with children. And I know that you were looking at um, caregivers' roles predominantly. But I was just interested as to whether or not you've done that, and because we we've tried to do that, and yes. there are some challenges. Yes, we've been thinking actually about it um, a lot in, in, in the lab. So best ways to kind of pull that information um, out from, from younger children. We've thought a lot and actually um, Danielle and Rebecca might know this, but there's someone in, in our pain, childhood pain network in Canada who's doing work um, involving children kind of drawing their experience mm -hmm. and then that being kind of a conversation starter yeah. to understand what things are like. So we have thought actually about how we might do that. Brilliant. Yeah, that's great. It's, it's difficult because you want to engage with all of the people who are involved. However, a two-year-old's way of communicating is very, yes. very different. Yes, and yes. It's quite challenging yeah, yeah, yeah. to understand. Yeah, please do. Okay, great. Uh, thanks everyone for joining online. Um, my name is Charlene Chu. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Toronto alongside Lindsay. Uh, you can tell here by the progression of our uh, work, we're kind of covering digital health from a cradle to grave kind of situation <laughs> here. Um, so my program of research is really focused on uh, co-designing uh, interventions, technology-based interventions for older adults um, to help them age in place and to help them age in whatever they feel like is the right place for them. Um, since this is about remote monitoring, I've decided to focus on one stream of my larger research program um, on a, a multimodal AI-based sensor platform for older individuals. Uh, the acronym for this is Maison, and if you speak French, you know that this actually means home in French. 
So um, I'm going to talk about uh, a bit about the team, the background, the motivation behind why we have the Maison system. I'll talk a bit about the system itself and then several of the use cases that we are investigating um, with uh, that, that, that's funded research, um, as well as some upcoming projects that we have will end off with challenges and next steps. So I'll try to um, go through this kind of in an expedient manner. And certainly if you have any questions, you can just let me know. Um, so this is the overarching team. Um, it's an interdisciplinary team. My co-PI is a computer scientist, um, as well as an engineer. Um, we have a postdoc who is also a computer scientist and an engineer. And we have a uh, MSc student who is in her first year, Farana, um, and she is being closely supervised by myself and Dr. So we know that the world is aging. Uh, the UN pro uh, projects that by 2050, we are going to have 2.1 billion older adults. Um, this represents 21.5% of the global population. Um, and because age is a primary risk factor for a number of different diseases, uh, for example, Alzheimer's disease, as well as physical and sensory impairments, for example, osteoarthritis, um, cataracts, macular degeneration, and so forth, um, we will need healthcare workers to provide care for this population. However, the WHO and other large organizations have indicated that we do have a shortage of healthcare workers. And to date, um, there is a need for 7.2 million more healthcare workers worldwide. And this is especially true for our low and middle income countries. And so the graph that you see on the side of the screen there is from the UN and it shows that the growth um, in the developing countries, which are the orange bars is you know, much more than the uh, gray portions of those bar, which are the uh, developed countries. So this problem is also confounded by the fact that there's a shortage of family caregivers. So often family caregivers, as Linda Z spoke about, you know, are the parents, are the spouses, are the children of older adults who provide this maintenance care, informal care. However, um, you know, re research and literature indicates that caregivers themselves, number one, have physical ailments often related to the fact that they are caregivers. Um, and there's also, uh, they are becoming older themselves. And so uh, we're, we're running into the situation where we have a shortage of healthcare workers and we also have a shortage of family caregivers. And then when we ask the question, what is healthy or active aging look like? What do, we, what do older adults want? Well, we know that older adults, based on the literature from the UK, from Canada's uh, National Institute of Aging, as well as the US, is that older adults want to stay at home. And in fact, a very um, well-known article talks about how older adults would actually rather die than go into a nursing home, for example. And so we know that older adults want to stay at home and there is a multitude of benefits that come with aging in place or aging at home. Um, this helps promote their self-satisfaction and life satisfaction. They have increased autonomy. They are able to maintain um, you know, their community, stay part of their neighborhoods that they know. Um, and it actually is more cost-effective to decentralize this care to try to keep people at home than you know, for example, zoning and building, refurbishing uh, new long-term care homes that would then house uh, older adults who need to um, age in place or age someone. So this leads us to a situation where we have a growing population of older adults who want to age at home without sufficient care and support. So as Alicia has mentioned, digital health solutions like smart home technologies can help enable remote monitoring and help older adults um, age in place or age at home. Um, and so recently there's been a lot of these uh, solutions that have come to the forefront. Uh, in one of our papers, we've compared several of these different smart home uh, solutions and systems. Um, and so each has their own strengths and weaknesses. We've published this in a paper in IEEE. Um, I'm happy to share that. Um, but there are some, uh, you know, limitations for some. Um, and so we tried to uh, create a system that would overcome some of these uh, limitations, including uh, the use of third party sensors, um, having a cloud backend, as well as geofencing. 
So the Maison system essentially is made out of a uh, bespoke um, watch and uh, phone application that we co-designed uh, with older adults. And so the app um, on the watch itself was also generated uh, using this methodology. Um, and then in addition to that, they have a wearable sensor, often a watch, which um, we have many different variations of watches that can collect different types of information. And then we have non-wearable sensors, which are ambient sensors that are placed in the home, for example, um, uh, motion detectors or bed sensors, chair sensors, things like that. Each of those devices are all connected to their third-party APA cloud. And then all of that information is then um, synchronized and put into um, like a larger Maison central cloud. So uh, we have conducted co-design to identify what are the best sensors to use, which watches should we uh, take a look at, um, and we involve uh, people during this process too, even for the selection. This is just a larger screenshot of kind of the app. We tried to make it simple and streamlined, easy for older adults and their caregivers who are under duress um, and distress. And you know they often live busy lives to be able to use. Um, and then this is just the interface for the watch as well. And surprisingly, the blue is more prominent in this. It's not actually as prominent. Um, it's very clear how it is on and off and on the actual watch. But uh, in any case, this is just a, a screenshot of that. So. You can imagine then that this technology, which is based on the Internet of Things, where you are able to live at home and you have a multitude of sensors, you know, collecting information as you are just living your life day to day. Um, we call them zero sum, uh, zero effort technologies. In addition to this, what we have is we use another um, additional research methodology that we call that is called uh, ecological uh, momentary assessment. And so you can imagine this to be sort of these um, digital diaries where uh, the user would get prompts on their phone, which they would fill out, and that becomes part of the data itself. And so we use this in a variety of different ways, but it provides real world contextual information to help us understand what is actually happening when we see uh, signals detected uh, using the rest of the sensors. And so there's a multitude of uh, benefits when it comes to using sensor-based systems like the Maison. Um, specifically for our system, uh, we can use a variety of different sensors, a variety of different wearables that really can be switched out based on whatever clinical problem you're interested in. Um, and then the second is that there is this seamless data collection that we um, have um, investigated and we know that clinically it is, and clinically and tech, uh, from a technological perspective, it is feasible um, and it is easy for older adults to use. And we've uh, evaluated that in the past. Um, we know that we can use this data to be able to assess patterns, understand uh, what is normal, what is abnormal, and then hopefully uh, in the future, we're going to start building predictive models once we have um, more and more data. And then lastly, we are able to collect you know, this multimodal um, technology, uh, multimodal uh, sensor data, which means that we are able to um, gather information from a variety of different sources, um, data that is physiological in nature, the behaviors, their activities, as well as contextual using the EMA. So of course, this type of technology is not without its ethical issues. And so we published a scoping review um, on this, looking at the ethical issues of using smart home-based um, care for older adults. So this is a scoping review. Some of the main things that we've um, identified, our main themes were around safety and security. So older adults were more willing to welcome this type of technology into their home if they knew it would keep them safe. Um, there's the idea around informed consent and consent itself. So how do you continue to have informed consent where perhaps the older adults, um, their own cognitive capacity uh, might be changing over time and technology will change over time. So how do you actually make somebody, um, how do you actually ensure that you have informed consent? Um, there's issues around privacy. So who has access to my data? Where is my data being stored? As well as autonomy. So who is making the decisions um, around the system and what kind of decisions can I still make as a person? 
So I'll launch now into my funded uh, projects related to this kind of baseline um, system that we've developed. Uh, one of the first projects that we're looking at is around social isolation in older adults who are discharged from physical rehabilitation. So uh, older adults that have, for example, experienced a stroke, need to regain the ability to walk, regain uh, the ability to talk. And so we know that social isolation is a really big problem for this population and is related to a lot of other chronic conditions like cardiovascular vascular disease, depression, as well as cognitive decline. But social isolation is not assessed. So in Canada, we have these 15-minute GP, um, you know, appointments where you really can only focus on one issue. And often, if you are going to see your family doctor, you're not going to be talking about your social isolation. You're going to be focused on something else. So often, social isolation is not part of the conversation. And, and when somebody is discharged home after rehabilitation, how they reintegrate back into their own community really is unknown. Nobody knows that trajectory. So we're hoping to use this remote monitoring system to be able to, to, to detect some of the behavioral changes that might indicate social isolation um, using the system. So here's an example of some data that we've visualized. This is not patient data. This is uh, somebody from our team um, and somebody else from our lab. But you can see here that this is one outing from an individual where they've left home. They've walked across Bloor Street. This is a, an aerial view of Toronto. Um, and eventually they ended up. Um, in, in another part of Toronto here, and you can tell where they're spending most of their time on that day in this one trip. So when we imagine using this type of data um, and visualizing somebody who is socially isolated or not, we're able to kind of determine and discern some differences there. The second project that we're looking at that's funded by the Longitudinal Prize on Dementia, um, so uh, one of the funders is Innovation UK, um, is looking at trying to detect and predict agitation in people who have dementia. So when you have dementia and you live at home, one of the biggest challenges for keeping somebody at home is their responsive behaviors. That's what we hear over and over again from anybody who is a caregiver of somebody who has dementia. Um, and so the, these responsive behaviors, because they are unpredictable in nature and vary depending on person to person, um, the thought process here is if we could predict when somebody would become agitated that the caregiver would be able to receive a notification and then they could be proactive in helping to manage that agitation. Therefore, that person would be able to be at home um, longer. So in um, Ontario and in Canada, you know, the verbiage around this has changed to responsive behaviors because we truly believe that these behaviors are because somebody's responding to something, um, and so therefore they can be addressed if you can address them in time. So that's the, the kind of um, impetus for this. In this, um, in our previous work looking at agitation, this is using a different kind of um, wash that would be different from uh, the the social isolation study. In this study, we looked at. Um, people who had dementia, but they were on a locked dementia unit. And in this study, we were able, just based on smartwatch data, able to identify when somebody was agitated, actually. So this first kind of section going across is their beats per minute. Um, the second is the um, acceleration, so their, um, how fast they're moving their wrist or their motion. The third uh, bar across is actually skin conductivity. And then uh, the last is their temperature. So when we see this um, point in time where there is this variance of all of these four different factors um, that this person actually was agitated and we had brown truths to kind of represent this. So we do have some indicators where you can actually see agitation without having to actually observe the person, but you can tell just based on uh, their sensor data, which we feel is um, quite a, an important contribution to the science. Uh, the third project that we're looking at is funded by the AMS, um, and so this is a project that I'll, I'll be embarking on, and it's looking at hip fracture recovery. So in Canada, especially with older adults, uh, hip fractures are a huge problem. They cost a ton of money um, and, are, and are really devastating to older adults because um, they not only are at very high risk of injury for another fracture, but they also have increased mortality. And there's, in, there's a research to show that often within two years, of having a hip fracture, they end up going into long-term care. And so um, even though we spend a lot of money when it comes to hip fracture treatment, 
For example, um, if somebody falls and they have a hip fracture, you have to diagnose that they have a hip fracture, they have to go to surgery, you have to do the surgery, they have to go to um, inpatient rehabilitation where they stay for at least 30 days, and then they go home and often they have very little follow up once they are discharged home. So the idea here is that we are able to observe them over time and um, try to identify what is the trajectory of recovery of their physical function um, and how that, how that um, might intersect with things like their social interaction and, um, and others. Um, and so with this study, we will actually be trying to co-design the machine learning model, which is something that is unique to um, the other projects. So this is kind of how the data that we're collecting would be visualized more traditionally. Um, this is within a 24 hour period of time with the detection of motion uh, in somebody's home. So this is a motion detector in their living room. So you can see here from zero to four o'clock in the morning, they're like pretty active and they're awake in their living room. Presumably they went to sleep between the hours of four to 9 a.m. with like maybe one blip. So perhaps they came down to get a glass of water or something. Um, and then they're awake, they're um, moving around in their home. There's a period of time where they've left um, and we are able to corroborate that with their geofencing GPS data. And then they return back home and there's activity back in their home. So you can see how we are inferring their behavior, looking at a broader picture of what's happening using these multiple forms of data. This is their step count across time, not just on one day, but across 45 days. And so we can see variations in their step count. Um, when we're looking at a problem like physical function and recovery, we obviously would be expecting a trajectory upward where as somebody physically recovers, you're able to see more movement, more counts, um, more exits, for example. Um, I forget if this is the last project I'm talking about. Yes. Um, so one of the last uh, projects that we have currently in motion is funded by the Alzheimer's Society, and I have a new investigator award looking at this um, issue, is that um, since I'm going to say October 2018, when, canna uh, when cannabis was legalized in Canada, one of the kind of superstars of the industry um, was CBD. So there's THC products where you get that euphoria and CBD, which um, you kind of have more of like a, a body high, but you don't actually get any of the um, psychological effects of cannabis. And so um, a lot of older adults ended up buying and trying cannabis for a variety of different reasons. So for example, to help them sleep, for anxiety, arthritis pain, so on and so forth. And this includes older adults who have dementia, often to treat things like responsive behaviors. But it's unclear, you know, who is providing them with the cannabis, when do they take it, what effects are they seeing? Um, and so all of this, there's a big question mark around this. So we're hoping to use the Maison system to start to examine this. Um, I use this, I, I've included this because I think that this is slightly different than the other projects where um, it's more observational in nature, where, you know, the older adult is kind of living their life and the sensor system is able to measure them as they're going through their day to day life. Here we are able to use a sensor system to actually do a pre and post and understand the impact of various different interventions um, that might be used. So one of the uh, assumptions here in this study is that the caregivers of older adults who have dementia living at home would be filling out um, those daily diaries. And so a question here is when somebody, um, specifically the family caregiver, is, is their observation actually accurate? So the um, I'll rephrase it another way, which is, is whatever the... Um, spouse is recording, is that actually picked up in the sensor data? And so we were able to, to do a small um, uh, feasibility study, and we were able to see that, yes, actually, it is quite accurate. So um, whatever the caregiver is inserting into the app using um, their EMA, we are actually seeing that being uh, reflected in the sensor data. And so that was really exciting for us because that allows us to think about a different way about how we label our data, um, not only um, to use the EMA information as contextual um, understanding. Um, some of the work that we will be 
embarking on. We have not started yet. Um, so one project is a frailty project. So uh, frailty is um, a risk factor for older adults, um, and it is irreversible. So often an older adult who might experience a fall or hospitalization often is, uh, has frailty. Free frailty, on the other hand, is reversible, but the distinction between the two is quite blurred. So we've conducted a systematic review and we've established that sensor systems assessing frailty at home is possible and that there are clinically validated sensors that can be used to detect frailty. Uh, the question is, though, can we detect pre-frailty from frailty, and can we detect when somebody becomes frail? And when we can detect that, perhaps we could possibly predict uh, when frailty will happen. So uh, this is a project that is up and coming. Um, and then another project that I have funded by NSERC um, is actually looking at, at healthy and active aging. So often digital ageism promotes the use of technology development in older adults with chronic illnesses. That's who we want to focus on. But a lot of older adults age in place and they age at home and they are okay. Um, and there's less insight and there's less normative value about how they are doing, especially um, when you're looking at things like gender, like income, like race. Um, and so this project aims to kind of uh, use the Maison system uh, to collect a larger data set um, of healthy older adults um, in order to kind of look at some of these trends to establish some normative values. Okay, challenges and considerations. Recruitment obviously is a challenge. It takes a very special kind of person to say that they are willing to be um, monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Compliance, that is wearing the watch, taking care of the watch, charging the watch. And then the ground truth. Obviously, we need to have some kind of um, balance between what the person is filling out versus what is just being collected. Our next steps here, um, we have a project that is based on this, is on co-design of all of these projects, continuing to collaborate with our partners, continuing to validate the system, as well as collaborating with clinicians for implementation. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them offline because I know we are over time now. Thank you. <laughs> um, do we have any quick questions for Shani before we draw things to a close? Any online? I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Okay, um, I'll, I have a couple of sure. questions that I'll ask you afterwards. <laughs> sure. um, just wanted to say thank you very much to Alicia, Lindsay and Charlene. Um, I hope everybody online has enjoyed the presentations as much as we have here. And uh, we will be circulating this recording for people to listen to afterwards. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Cheerio. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.